right? So, so what I'm trying to do is trying to give you people here who are phenomenally successful using pure fundamental analysis on one hand and complete disdain for technical analysis, and people who have been enormously successful using pure technical analysis and complete cynicism about fundamental analysis, right? So you got the, you can't get further apart. It's got to tell you one thing. It's got to tell you there's no single way. There's no single uh, road. There's no single message. If you're looking for that, you, you haven't even got the right question, let alone the right answer. So I, 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 I'm going to quote myself. I don't quote myself very often, but I will for one time in this, in this talk. And in one of my books, I used the line because I think it applies to this. And it's, I said, there's a million ways to make money in the markets. And they're unfortunately all very difficult to find. But there are many, many ways. So the first thing to realize is you have to find a path and not to find the path. Okay, that leads us to the first principle. And the first, and if you take nothing else out of this talk, if you just take this out of it, you, it'll be worthwhile, I guarantee you. And that is every trader I ever interviewed, I could say this about. They found a method that fit their personality. Now, you know, some of you may say, well, well doesn't anybody do that? I mean, it seems logical. Wouldn't you trade your own? Well, no, you really wouldn't. Uh, think about it. And those of you who are traders, you probably could think of uh, examples right off the bat. But I've known certainly traders who may have been, they may have had, let's say, a, a good knack analytically and could have done really well putting together some systematized approach and traded it, but no, too boring. Or no, they have to second guess it. Or no, they have to be more involved. Or it's too slow. Or whatever. Or you have traders who, who are really good on the floor. they got the real instincts. But they get tired of all these uh, fellows up in the office trading 10 times as much as they are in all these markets, so they want to be one of those guys up in the fancy office and, and, and so on. And they go do that, and they become a mediocre trader off the floor. You constantly have people doing things which are not fitting to their personality. Now, let me illustrate what I mean by trading to fit your personality. Again, let's take specific examples, specific people. First, we'll take Paul Tudor Jones. Paul. <clears throat> One of the great future traders, you know, of, of our time, um, and particularly in his initial years when he was managing small amounts of money, just had some incredible, for a decade, 10, 15 years of incredible performance. Uh, when I interviewed him, he said, um, come to my office at 2 o'clock, you know. And I said, I knew he's an active trader, so I said, well, Paul, you know, I can, I can come after the market close, no problem. He said, no, come 2 o'clock, it's fine. Okay, come to his office, big office, screens all the way across the walls, He's got speaker phones that directly connect to the floors. He's got regular phones. He's got people bringing him messages. He's yelling out, sell 300 March S&P, buy 500. All the interviews are selling and buying and, and people and phones are ringing and everything's going on. He's looking at the screens and he's doing the interview. Okay. So I kind of say like, like watching Paul, um, Paul trade is sort of like watching a professional tennis player on speed or something like that. I mean, he's just like really active and aggressive. That's Paul. That's his, uh, that's his, that's his style. That works for him. Let's take another picture. Gil Blake. Gil Blake is a mutual fund timer. When I interviewed him, he had a 12-year track record, average returns of about 45% per year. Very steady. His worst year was like plus 35. His, um, his worst was 30, plus 35. His best was about plus 55. Never lost more than 5% from a peak to a valley. Very, very consistent trader. What did he do? He actually, way interesting way he got into the um, into the markets. He was a uh, he was a financial officer for a firm, knew nothing about trading or investing, and a friend of his came in one day and said, "Look, Gil, I found this. I've been timing mutual funds, and I've got this little pattern that I found, and it works." And Gil says, "Nonsense! You know, nothing that simple is going to work. Give it to me." And so he took the numbers and he went over it, you know, and it, and it worked. He couldn't find anything that was really wrong with it. And that got him intrigued. Then he started really looking at it more closely. And he came up with patterns that were really much more effective. And he became so convinced that there was something there that he quit his job and became a, he became a trader, which led to the performance record I told you about. He would go to the library. He didn't even use a uh, computer to do his work. He would go to the library, go through, look through microfiche, look for all these mutual fund prices and look for patterns. And just spend weeks in the library just flipping through these price patterns. Now. That was, and he'd go back and he'd be trading out of his one, uh, out of his bedroom at home and that was his style. No other people, no other phones, no computers, nothing. That's Gil Blake. Now could you picture, could you picture Gil Blake in Paul Tudor Jones's office? Could you picture Paul Tudor Jones and Gil, you know, going through the microfiche? I mean, it just is such a contrast. And if either one tried to do the other, they would absolutely fail. There is a uh, Wall Street adage that goes something along the line, 
Even a poor trading system could make money with good money management. Have you heard that before? You got that? Okay, if you have that, forget it, because it's really one of the stupidest things that has ever been said. Okay, if you, now I'll, I'll illustrate that. If you believe that, then I invite you to go to Las Vegas and go over to a roulette wheel and, and use your best money management system and see how far you get. And in fact, if you were to ask 100 mathematicians the following question, I'm going to play roulette, what betting strategy, what money management strategy is going to be optimize my results? They all should give you the same answer. You know what the answer is? You have, let's say you have $1,000, you walk over to the roulette wheel, pick red or black, put it all down, bet once, win or lose, walk away. Those are your highest odds. Now, yes, they're less than 50-50, but only a little bit. But the longer you play, the more your, your odds go down. So if you don't have, and here's the point, if you don't have the edge, good money management is actually the epitome of bad money management. You actually bet it all at once, because anything else you lose, you have a higher and higher probability of losing. So it's not enough to have money management, you actually do have to have an edge. And having an edge means that you have a method. No trader I ever interviewed, when I asked them, how do you do what you do, they all, some explain it actually very, very explicitly, some more generally, but they all have some specific type of approach. No trader ever said, well, you know, I wake up and I look at the screen and the bonds look good to me, I'll just buy them. I mean, nobody had a cavalier uh, shoot from the hip approach. They all had specific methodologies. That's essential to, uh, to a winning approach. The next thing we come to is the concept of hard work. It is amazing how, how, how workaholic-like these people are as a group. And I can give you lots of examples. In fact, most of the people would fall into the category. I'll take one example out of the most recent book, uh, and that's David Shaw, a uh, very secretive uh, fellow who uh, runs this uh, hedge fund, uh, which is a uh, statistical arbitrage, I guess, to put it into a category. What they're doing essentially, <clears throat> and he's been running this fund now for about 13 years, with excellent, excellent results. Uh, and what they, what they do is they trade literally about 10 different world, all the major world markets. They're, they're monitoring all the equities, all the derivatives, and they're running about probably 20 different mathematical models simultaneously and looking for tiny mispricings, and it's all working interrelated uh, with, with tremendous computer power. He hires, he has scores of the best PhDs in mathematics and physicists uh, and computer science working for him. It's an incredibly complex, sophisticated approach. I mean, extraordinarily so. You would think that monitoring this and, and supervising this and working on this would be enough, but no. David Shaw, over the years, has also been developing companies. Uh, probably one of the better, I mean, quite a number of them, uh, which he then spins off and sells. Probably the best known one is Juno, which is the website which he sold off. And he sold another one off to Merrill Lynch for their computer uh, trading uh, pro, uh, department. and and so on. And if that's not enough, he's got a hobby which is applying computer science to, uh, to, to, uh, to development of, of, of drugs. That's, that's, that's David Shaw. And he's, he's really kind of typical of the person that, to get, that is really successful. Uh, and, and I said there's really lots of types of examples. Another, I'll give you another example. John Bender is an options trader I viewed in the last book. He would be trading options both in the U.S. markets and, it, and the Japanese markets, and he would be up and trading and watching both of those markets. So, and they're completely different. They're 12 hours apart. They're, so, you know, you figure out when he sleeps and doesn't anything else. Okay, so that gives you kind of a flavor of what I mean by hard work. Now, the, the irony here is, why do most people get involved, or the general public, why is the general public attracted to markets and trading? Because it seems like an easy way to make a lot of money. And the irony is that people who are really successful are, are tremendously hard workers and people are attracted to the markets because they want to make money easy. Why such a contrast? What, you know, what's the answer? And there is an answer to the paradox. And the answer is this. Trading is probably the only world's profession where the rank amateur, the person that knows absolutely nothing, has a 50-50 chance of being right in the beginning. Why? Because there's only two things you can do. You could buy or you could sell. And some people are just going to get it right by probability, at least a few times in the beginning. And that beguiles people to think that trading is a lot easier than it is, because it is possible to get short-term success by pure luck. And that fools people. Good trading 
should be effortless. Right? So, kind of, what, what is the guy talking about? First he says hard work, now I'm telling you effortless. Okay. Here's the difference. The process, the, the preparation is where the hard work comes. The process should be effortless. If it's not going right, you can't force it right by working harder. If your trading is just not working, if you're, if you're in a, b a bad period, trying harder, it'll probably make it worse. You can't try harder, you can't work harder. You can work harder in doing more research. You can work harder in trying to figure out what's going wrong, but you can't work harder at trading. You have to probably in that point just ease back, just, just maybe not trade, maybe trade less. Because it's not effortless. And if when you're trading well, it's not work. It's effortless. Again, difference between preparation and process. Bruce Kovner, who uh, at the time actually still a huge trader, uh, one of the most successful current currency traders ever, um, taught and takes huge, huge positions. I mean, when I was, even when I interviewed him, he was trading about a billion dollars. I don't know what he trades now, probably multiples of that. So he takes such large positions, he says, whenever I take a position, I know where I'm getting out before I get in. And he said, otherwise I couldn't, you know, I couldn't sleep. And, and, and the key point there is, by knowing where you get out before you get in, you make that decision when you have objectivity. Because once you're in the position, you lose that objectivity. And, and he basically decides where should the market not go if he's right. And he decides that before he puts out a position. I think it's a very good way to operate. Okay, next, next, next theme is independence. Should come as no surprise that these people who are very successful as traders are independent. Michael Marcus says it very well. He says, every trader has to follow their own light. He said, you can take the world's two best traders and put them together and then you get the worst of both traders. And um, he's actually thinking of him, uh, he, when he's thinking of two good traders, he and Bruce Kovner worked together for a while and uh, they were indeed two of the world's best traders. And he's saying no matter how good the trader is, if you, if you try to combine method, methodology or try to combine Opinions, you'll get you'll get much worse results. Occurred, and this is back uh, quite a number of years ago. I was trading my own, my own commodity account, and um, I had done okay. But in the last few months, I had actually had a poor period. And I was down money, and I had kind of cut back my positions. I had maybe one major position left, and, and there was one of the traders that I interviewed that would call me periodically, and uh, he calls me that day, and um, I'm not going to mention names who it is, but he, for whatever reason, he would want to know my opinion. I used to be a technical analyst as well. And he would like to know my opinions on the market. Maybe he was, he's much better traded than I was. Maybe he was fading me. I don't know. But uh, he just calls me for my opinion. So we go over the markets and he gets to the Japanese yen. And that happened to be the one trade I had on that I had any confidence in. And uh, he says, well, what do you think about Japanese yen? And he said, you know, well, I said, well. I said, you know, it's had this real sharp decline and it's going into this tiny nodal consolidation. And my experience is when you have that combined pattern, the market usually goes down again. And he says, no, no, you're wrong. And he, he gives me 80 reasons of why this oscillator is overdone and this one's overdone and this is, you know, this technical indicator is this way. He gives me all these reasons why I'm wrong and I say, you know what, you're probably right, but it's just an opinion. So I hang up the phone and I, I'll tell you, even back then, this is like 10 years ago, I still, I was, I knew enough not to listen to anybody's opinion. But here's the thing, I had a trip out, I had to leave to Washington DC that afternoon and I was going to be gone for a couple of days and I knew I couldn't watch the markets. That's my, so here's, here comes my nationalization. So I said, okay, I, I've been, not been doing so great lately. I've got one significant position left. Do I really want, I'm not going to be here to watch it. That's, that's the whole, <laughs> here's the rub. I'm not going to be here to watch it. That gave me my out. Do I really want to fade one of the world's best traders? So after hours, the market's closed already because I didn't get out after I spoke to him, but I, afterwards I said, well, maybe I should get out. So I walk over to the after hours desk. I put in the order. I liquidate my position. Okay, I'm sure it's not going to be any surprise to anybody in this room. I come back a couple of days and he ends down 200 points. I mean, I'm sure you expected me to tell you that, and that's what happened. But here's where, where you have to believe me that this is exactly as it happened. Turns out he calls again that day. And I wasn't going to be so, so, <laughs> um, a ghost, let's say, ask him directly, well, what about the yen? Right, so we're talking and he's going, he has different markets. I don't raise the yen at all. Then he says, uh, he talks about the yen. Ah, yes. I said, I play dumb. I said, oh, yes, the yen, yen, yen. It, are, are you still long? And he exclaims over the phone, long? I'm short. What I didn't tell you is he's a short-term trader. I mean, for him, a, a long-term trade might be a day. And for me, a short-term trade might be four weeks. So when he talked to me, he indeed was bullish. He was looking for a bounce. The market probably didn't act, they didn't act right. Uh, decided he was on the wrong side, took his five point profits, went short, made 200 points, I was right all along, got nothing. The point is, 
if you listen to anybody's opinion, no matter how good they are, no matter how smart they are, I guarantee you it's going to blow up in your face. You just cannot get ahead by listening to other people's opinion. You have to generate your own ideas. Why risk it? Why not just bank it, put in the bills, retire, go home, call it a day? I mean, it doesn't seem to make any sense to keep on doing it. And, and the answer I get, in one form or another, um, well, the best way to give you just a, uh, one answer to this would be Paul Tudor Jones. He said, well, I, I keep 85% of my money in my own funds. Why? Why? Because it's the safest place for it. This is from a futures trader. So in his mind, keeping money in his own funds is safer than T-bills, I mean, or as safe as T-bills. What does that tell you? It tells you the guy has a lot of confidence. And Monroe Trout just goes in one better. He puts 95 cents of the other money. And now that I'm running, you know, I'm running uh, uh, fund of funds, uh, and a lot of managers that I'm interviewing, they have 100 percent of the money. I mean, some one guy had like 100 percent plus his home equity. And I mean, these people have, <laughs> which is always good to know, you know, the, but these people have a lot of confidence in what they're doing. It's and, and, and which comes from? I mean, are they successful because of the confidence, or are they confident because of successful? It's kind of a hard answer, good question to answer. But I can tell you this, that that. The one way to gauge it is, is whether you're going to be successful is whether you really have confidence. And often I'll peek, speak to traders and, and they, um, you know, trying to find a methodology or, or they're unsure. But I, I could tell them if you don't have, if you don't know that you have the confidence, if you're not sure or just about sure you're going to win, then you're not there yet. And you have to be aware and you have to go much more slowly. And only the per, only you as a, as the individual can decide or will know when you have the confidence. But I can tell you the traders are really good they exude that confidence, and you just know it. And it's very important to understand, and that is that losing is part of the game. Now, let me illustrate that with a comment by Linda Rashke, who's uh, so, uh, probably a lot of people in this room, more people in this room will know Linda Rashke, I think, than most audiences I speak to. But Linda Rashke has been, it was started out as, a, a, as an uh, options trader on the floor. Um, she had a horse riding accident and then ended up having to trade from an office, and she became quite successful trading from an office. And she's done both, both of them quite, quite well. Linda said to me, it never bothers me to lose because I know I will always make it back. Never bothers me to lose because I know I will always make it right back. Now, does, does, doesn't that sound like an arrogant comment, an egotistical comment? But if you know Linda, she's a very modest person. She's very soft-spoken. She doesn't make anything about what she does. That's not her at all. All she's saying is this, I've got a methodology. It's going to win in the long run. Along the way, there are going to be some losses. As long as I stick with the methodology and keep doing what I'm doing, I'm going to come out ahead. If I lose now, I'll be win, win subsequently, and I will come out ahead. So that's all she's saying. She's saying that losing is part of the process, and you have to understand that. Dr. Van Tharp, who um, I interviewed in my first book and spent his career interviewing traders, and counsels traders, and that's it. That's it. he's kind of doing a professionally what I did in my books. He had this comment about the traders he found most successful. He says all successful traders that he that he interviewed, the best ones, know they've won the game before they start. Now, if you know you won the game before you start, then there's no problem taking a loss because you understand that that's just part of the way of getting to the ultimate game. Uh, Marty Schwartz had a really interesting way of putting this whole, this whole concept about losing being part of the game. He said, what is the rallying cry of the losing trader? I'll get out when I'm even. Okay, think about it. Why is getting out even so important? Because if you get out even, you could say, I wasn't wrong, I didn't mistake, I didn't make a mistake. And that need not to be wrong that that need to fulfill the ego, to, to be right or not to have made a mistake, is exactly why people lose. So the irony is people lose because they don't want to lose or they don't want to take a loss. And the real and the professional traders understand that to win they've got to take losses. That's part of the process. Uh, the, uh, there is the fool who does wrong uh, at all times, but then there is the Wall Street fool who, who thinks he must trade at all times. So it's roughly paraphrasing it. And the idea is that, that you have to really wait for the opportunities. You just can't try to trade all the time. Jim Rogers has a good way of putting it. He says, I just wait until there's money lying there in the corner of the floor, and all I have to do is walk up and pick it up off the floor. 
You know, in other words, until something is so obvious, until a trade is so obvious, that it's like taking money off the floor, he does nothing. What does that say? It says patience. Patience is essential to good trading. Uh, another trader had the uh, had this way of putting t- talking about patience. He said uh, he used an animal analogy. He says uh, the first the world's fastest animal is a cheetah. And, and uh, but what will the cheetah do? It won't just go chase after any antelope. It'll wait in the bush for a week until it sees a baby antelope, and preferably a lame baby antelope, and then it'll strike. And he says that's the epitome of a professional trader. So it's again waiting for the right opportunity. Or uh, it was both Dennis and Eckhart who trained the turtles. It wasn't just Dennis. And uh, Eckhart is a PhD mathematician. He's done quite well as a CTA over the years. And he talks about this this this, uh, this concept. He says there's this adage, this Wall Street adage, that you never go broke taking a small profit. You know, probably have heard that one. And he said that's a really wrong-headed approach. Amateurs, he says, go broke taking large losses. Professionals go broke taking small profits. The message is, whatever your methodology is and whatever represents long or short, you have to allow the good trades to work to their reasonable fruition if you want to pay for the losing trades. So again, the importance of patience both in getting in and getting out. <clears throat> now, loyalty is a good trade, right? I mean, if you want loyalty in friends, family, pets, nice trade. As a trader, it's exactly the opposite of what you want. You don't want loyalty as a trader. Uh, the best example I can give you uh, concerns Stanley Druckenmiller. Stanley Druckenmiller, oh, and the date of this example, I'll give you the exact date. The exact date of this example is October 16th, 1987. October 16th, 1987. For those of you who are scrambling, I'll give you a hint, it's a Friday. On that day, Stanley Druckenmiller, he was at the time, uh, Stanley, by the way, uh, probably you know Stanley, but he managed to, uh, he worked for George Soros for many years, and uh, for many years ran the Quantum Fund. Uh, even though people associated the Quantum Fund with Soros, for, for a large part of that time, Soros was spending most of his time in East Europe and the Soviet Union, uh, trying to get those countries over to capitalism and so forth. And the person who was really had his hands under control day in, day out was Stanley Druckenmiller. He's also run his own fund for 20 years and done terrific and uh, before he went to Druckenmiller, he was, he was running multiple funds for Dreyfus. And this is at that time he was at Dreyfus. So he came in that day and he was net short. Nice position to be in October 16th, 1987. Unfortunately, if you remember, a lot of people think of the market broke. They forget that the market was breaking sharply prior to that day, prior to the Monday. And uh, particularly on Friday, Friday was, a, was a, uh, also a very ugly day. The market was down a lot. And he decided, you know what, it's kind of getting down 2200, I think was what the level was coming down to. I think he said that, he said that's enough, the market's going to be near support. So, he took his profits, but not only did he take his profits, he decided to go net short. I'm sorry, net long. Net long. Now, I used to ask audiences, anybody here ever make a worse mistake than going from short to long on October 16th, 1987 in the U.S. stock market? Okay. I, the reason I stopped asking you that question is because I realized I couldn't make up a worse example. I don't think you can make up a worse example. The, the amazing thing is, if you look at his record for that month, it'll be about break even. Now, how is that possible? Well, first of all, first half of the month he was short, so he made money. Now here's the thing. After he put on a position on Friday, during the weekend, he decided he had made a mistake. He decided he was wrong. Why is this? We won't get into it. It's not important. You, won't, you, know, you can read it in the book if you want to know why. But he was sure he was wrong. So he decided he was going to get out Monday morning. Unfortunately, Monday morning comes around and the Dow opens over 200 points down to begin with. But what he did that, that Monday morning was, in that first hour trading, he covered his entire position. And get this, he went back short. Now think of the amazing flexibility. And then we're talking about a fellow managing, I guess, probably over a billion dollars at the time. To be able to reverse his position again after after the market has gone down that much overnight. That's a tremendous flexibility, tremendous lack of loyalty. It's a classic example of a professional trader, uh, which, which is uh, a point that goes back to Eckhart. It has to do about people's human nature, human nature in trading. And, and Bill Eckhart has, a, has an interesting comment. He says that people are so, so poorly attuned to trading that they will do worse than random. Now, you know the uh, academic comments, you know, the academic, now you'll see the academic say, well, you can take a monkey, 
and give him darts and put up a page of the Wall Street Journal and let the monkey throw darts, and the monkey will do as well as the professional money managers. Okay, you've all heard something like that, I'm sure. Now, Bill Eckhart, so there's no confusion here, Bill Eckhart is not saying that. He's not saying the monkey's going to do as well as the professional money managers. He's saying the monkey's going to do better. <laughs> That's an important distinction. Now, why is the, mon why is the monkey going to do better? The monkey's going to do better because humans have evolved in such a way that they are particularly poorly attuned to trade. Humans seek comfort, whether it's food or shelter or sex or whatever, it's comfort. And you know what? Markets don't pay off for being comfortable. His point is markets pay off for being uncomfortable, for taking the uncomfortable position. And most people don't do that. They seek comfort in, the, in their trading as well. And that's why he says they're going to do worse than random, that you would literally, for most people, would literally make better choices if they threw darts. And, and examples, examples of uh, easy to find. Look, if you're in a position that's going against you, let's say, and, uh, and, and, and you say, oh, well, I'll, I'll get out, but I'll give it another three days. You know, I thought, oh, good, I got another chance. Feels good. It's usually the wrong decision. Or, or you're going to buy some stock or whatever, and it's, uh, and um, you, 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 you're buying it, let's say, at a lowest point it's been in the last six months. Kind of feels good because you're smarter than everybody else who bought that stock in the last six months. So it's, it, yeah, boy, aren't you smart? You've got the best buy in the last six months. Feels comfortable. So a lot of these trades that are done, which come out of an emotion of seeking comfort when you get right down to it, are going to end up being wrong. It's also, by the way, what, what, for those of you involved in the trading systems, this leads a lot of people to go wrong in developing trading systems. Because what do people do with trading systems? They, they will optimize and optimize and optimize until you get a really smooth curve. Now, doesn't that feel good to trade? Boy, you've got a curve here that's never lost in any given month. And that feels a lot better to trade than some trading system that has some wiggles to it. And the more you optimize, the smoother you get it. But the more you optimize, the greater the chances the system won't work at all. But again, it's part of this human nature seeking comfort. Last story. The last point is, look at the language of traders. They talk about, I've heard a description of talking about trading as a three-dimensional chess game. That's Bruce Kovner's line. Uh, Jim Rogers talks about 10,000, it's like a jigsaw puzzle of 10,000 pieces, and they're always throwing in new pieces, taking out some pieces and throwing in new pieces. Um, another trader talked about trading being like a chart, his chart book. He passed his chart book. He says, it's like a treasure hunt. He says, every week I, I go through this and I look for new treasure. And what are those? Those are all game-like analogies. And that tells you something. It tells you that to them, it, trading is almost like a game. It's something that's fun and something they love to do. And that's the essence of it. Whether it's trading or anything else, I guarantee you, look around people in your life who are successful. And the one thing I'm sure of is they love what they're doing. It's true of trading, it's true of anything. And unless you have that, that love and passion, you're not going to be successful. And it's essential to be, to be successful. 睇完呢十个逻辑之后咧，唔知道你中意边一个嘅逻辑咧？对于 better trading 嚟讲咧，最中意咧就系第一，揾出符合自己个性嘅交易方法；第三，极度勤奋；同埋第九，克服人性嘅弱点。原因系呢三点都系一个认清自己嘅过程，非常影响一个人嘅成与败。唔一定係交易，其他範疇都係一樣嘅。而我相信每一個人都有自己嘅長處同埋短處。如果能夠做到揚長避短，配合勤奮嘅態度，克服安穩嘅心態，基本上已經站於不敗之地。之後嘅成就大小就取決於運氣同埋時機。針對 Jack 嘅邏輯其實大多數人真正嘅問題就係冇交易計劃，即使有計劃都冇紀律去執行。如果你一早知道所有進場同埋離場嘅條件，配合程式，基本上就能夠解決大部分 Jack 所提到嘅憂慮。Better Trading 要強調並唔係話用。上程式交易就一定能够赚到钱，但系只要你明白到大多数人输钱嘅原因啊，系于情绪层面上边，你就明白程式系大幅度地减少损失嘅关键。如果你想了解更加多关于程式交易，我喺 description 上边会留低一个相关嘅链接，到时再见啦，拜拜。